Rabbi, we're ready. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Congregation with Door Door. I'm Brian Land, president of the Temple, and this is our last uh, community programming series for the, e for the year. Thank you so much for coming. Tonight, I will make this introduction very short and very sweet. We are pleased to welcome Ryan's Priebus, who is currently president of Michael Best and Friedrich LLP. Prior to joining us, he served our country and our president as White House Chaff Chief of Staff for President Trump. Not an easy job for anyone. Before serving the president, he served as the longest tenured chairman of the Republican National Committee, where he was the winningest chairman in any party's history. I would go on and on, but suffice it to say, he has had a remarkable career, and we are so fortunate that he has joined us tonight. Our second guest and dear friend of the temple is Congressman Steve Israel. Steve served in Congress for 16 years representing Long Island. He has shared with our temple and our community over the last two years his insights, and more importantly, I can tell you he is a master of history, and I think his mastership of our history has allowed him to take a look at the events of the day through the prism of history. He further does this as the owner of Theater's Books right here in Oyster Bay, a bookstore we know, we love, and we support. Finally, moderating our discussion tonight is our rabbi of 24 years. He has served the congregation, and tonight he will share his thoughts and moderate the discussion for all of you. Lastly, coming soon to our congregation, uh, coming in the fall will be Catherine Stewart and also Ted Deutsch, CEO of the American Jewish Committee. So we have a lot to look forward to, and since we're pressed for time, I'm going to let them get right on with it. So thank you all for coming, and hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Brian, and welcome to everyone who's joining us here in our congregation and who are joining us online. There will be an opportunity for people to ask questions. If you do want to ask a question, you, we do ask that you use the index cards. Uh, we're only going to be taking questions in that manner and those who submitted their questions prior uh, by uh, online through, through Cornell. So I'd like to begin, Ryan, just tell us a little bit about what, what was a typical day like in the Trump White House? Uh, well, first of all, Thank you, Rabbi, for having me. Steve Israel's a, a great friend. One of the reasons we like doing things like this is that we want, at the very least, people to see that you can have a Republican and Democrat that like each other, might not agree with each other in a lot of things, but I think it's really important for people to see that two people on the opposite sides of the political aisle can get along and enjoy each other's company. As long as there's a rabbi in between. Yeah, that's the only way it can work. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate you, you being the, the honorary referee tonight. Um, uh, bless you for that. Um, so a typical day in the White House. I mean, it's sort of what you might imagine. Uh, you get picked up first thing in the morning by the Secret Service. Uh, president calls you usually, at least in my case, after 6 o'clock, uh, right about 6.15, go into the White House, do an intelligence briefing right off the bat, and then you're just off to the races with issues of the day, whether it be, you know, airline regulation, whether it be, you know, firing James Comey, for example. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just normal things that you do in the White House. Uh, and, um, but a lot of it is, you know, you see in the media, it's pretty hyped up. You see all the, all the you know, the, the things that, that make news. But the reality is 90% of it is basic decision-making process, deputies, committees that get together before principals get involved. You can imagine them, you know, whether we're going to stay in the Paris Agreement or not, as a good example. Um, that would go through months of conversations with, with members in different cabinet positions, general counsels, starts with deputies, then moves to the principals, and ultimately, in the end, it ends up in the Oval Office in front of the president. And you know, in our case, working the phones with everyone that you can think of, and eventually presenting the president with a decision memo, and then he decides what he's going to do. Now, we all know that in the Trump White House, it's a little different. 
Um, in a lot of White Houses, you've got the same kinds of people working together. I mean, you all know what a Bush Republican is, right? You can see it, right? You know the same kind of Republican as a Bush Republican. The Clinton Democrat, you, you can see it. The Obama Democrat, you know who it is. You know, in a Trump White House, it, it's not the same species of people working together. You could have, you know, it's like natural predators. <laughs> and you've got a falcon and a seal, and, I mean, a, a, a shark and a seal, and a falcon and a rabbit, and a snake and a rat, and the president says, you know, what are we gonna do about NAFTA? And you got Gary Cohn, who was at Goldman Sachs for 20 years, Wilbur Ross, Bob Lighthizer, Steve Bannon, Reince Priebus, and you have people that they're smart in their own right. I mean, they got there not by accident, but what are we gonna do about NAFTA? And there's no walls up, right? I mean, the blood's on the floor. And it's a, not just a, it's a different way of governing, but it's a unique way, and uh, that was part of life in dealing in that capacity as chief of staff. So a lot of good times, a lot of challenging times, obviously you've read about them, so I'm not <laughs> saying anything you don't know, uh, but um, more of it is day-to-day uh, -day than what it would appear. I wanna, I wanna give Steve a chance to tell us a little bit about what it was like a typical day in Congress, and then I wanna come back to, to both of you in terms of like what do you miss and why did each of you leave? <laughs> well, Rob, I thank you for your leadership and thank you for hosting us uh, at Lador Vador and thanks to the Cornell community that is uh, viewing this uh, from not only Ithaca but points all over the world. Um, and a special thanks to, to Reince Priebus who is here um, as, a, as a volunteer, came up, flew up, uh, spent, uh, we had dinner together, spending time with us tonight and then needs to be on a 10 o'clock flight from LaGuardia to be able to get back to Washington, D.C., so I'm, I'm gonna be very uh, focused on, on his time, uh, which means I'm going to answer very succinctly. Uh, two members uh, of, of my former staff are, are here tonight, I see. They know what a typical day was like. 15 to 18 movements per day, either in Washington or in the district. That's 15 to 18 separate tasks on the schedule. Some of it was just a phone call, call a constituent, uh, or call another member to try and negotiate a bill. Uh, some of it was going to the floor to, to vote. Votes could be on the floor, it could be one quick vote, or it could be six hours uh, on the floor voting. But the one component of the schedule um, that uh, finally convinced <coughs> me that, uh, or helped convince me that it was time for me to, to leave Congress was the, the fundraising. Uh, and so typically you wake up uh, first thing you do is you go to a fundraiser, a pack fundraiser at the Tortilla Coast, which is a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> do not eat breakfast at Mexican restaurants. It is not a good idea. Or Johnny Half Shell, which is a seafood place. You do not want to be doing a fundraising breakfast at a seafood place. Uh, so you begin with a fundraiser, uh, and then you'll do some legislative work. And then halfway through the day, you go to the DCCC or the uh, uh, RNCC and make phone calls uh, to donors in order to raise the money that is necessary and then legislate uh, and do your constituent services and end the day typically three to five separate fundraising stops in the evening when there weren't votes. The average member of Congress, and I'm not, I don't do this to in any way criticize members of Congress. They are in this system. It is the result of our fundraise, uh, fundraising obligations. If you wanna get reelected, you've gotta raise a certain amount of money. So this is not meant to criticize them. But the, because of this system, the average member of Congress in a competitive district in a high-priced media market spends 20 hours to 30 hours a week on fundraising. And that's not good for the members, and it's not good for democracy, um, and it's uh, not good for, trying, for the, the hope that Congress, uh, the members of Congress will really focus on what really matters, not dialing for dollars, but figuring out how you're gonna help people in your district. And that's ultimately why you decided to leave Congress? That, that was a major part of it. I mean, I fundamentally believe that there comes a time when you have to pass the torch, but the fundraising regimen was, um, was really wearing me down. Back to you, Ryan. So why did you leave the, the Trump White House? No, there's a tweet about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know there is, but I, want, I, want, I have you next to me. I want you to tell me why. Well, I had resigned, uh, the truth is I resigned the day before. Um, and, 
You know, it was the right time, honestly. Um, I went six years running the RNC, and it, it, it wasn't just being, um, I wasn't just the chief of staff was my exposure to that, the, you know, the Trump White House. I was, as, pre as chairman of the RNC, I, we were essentially the Trump campaign, if you recall that time in history. So I had spent my time um, and I, I just decided that it was time to move on. The president, quite honestly, didn't fight me much about it, so it seemed like the right thing to do. And as you all know, you watched it, so I mean, it was a little chaotic, and to say the least, and it didn't feel good to me, you know, how things were going in the White House, and I don't think it felt good to the president either. And so it just felt like, you know, in my case, move on with class. I didn't write the book. I learned a good lesson about, you know, there's a lot of ways to go. And you've all seen the way that many people leave positions like that. They cash in, they write a book, they get an advance. Most stretch the truth quite a bit in these books. You know, it might have some truth to it, but they're always putting themselves at the center of things that they weren't actually really at the center of and, and gossiping. And I learned a good lesson about, you know, having the opportunity to take many routes and not punching people that in some cases deserved it but didn't do it. Um, you know, um, I decided that I was going to keep my mouth shut and just, you know, I'm just going to be friendly to everybody, even people that don't deserve it. And I, heard, I learned a good lesson about the value of that because through over time, I sort of came back in the play, I mean, politically. I, know I, hate, I don't know how else to put it, mm -hmm. but by keeping my mouth shut and learning the lesson of being quiet and being friendly with people that don't deserve it, in the end, I learned a big lesson, and I, I think that helped. I think that's extraordinarily important. <clears throat> Can you, reflecting back on your time as the, as the White House Chief of Staff, what are you most proud of? What accomplishment? Um, well, you know, look, we had, we had done so many things right off the bat in securing the border. Um, I think, in, in, thank you. Um, I, I, and, and really, uh, when it comes to eradicating ISIS, around the world, not eradicating completely, you all know that that's 100% true, but certainly going from a time when people were being burnt alive in cages to going to a time when, you know, you didn't, you know, we hardly hear about it today. You don't hear much about ISIS around the world. Uh, energy independence for the first time in 30 years. Um, and so many, you know, tax reform, some people don't like the bill here, I understand it, but the truth is, is that as far as a policy position goes, people can debate, and they do, you know, you know, not always what you say, but how you say it, right? I mean, we can debate some of those things in regard to the president, but when it comes to the accomplishments, as far as if you want to, that, if you're a Republican watching this, the accomplishments were pretty remarkable, um, and, and I'm proud of that. And, you know, for, I also think, and, and I don't want to get everyone riled up on these issues tonight. I really don't. But, you know, sometimes God uses imperfect people to do things that are, that are pretty remarkable, whether it be moving the, the capital of Israel to Jerusalem, whether it be the, the Abraham, okay, the, oh, the capital, <laughs> yeah, the embassy uh, to Jerusalem, uh, Abraham Accords, um, and a lot of other things that a lot of folks in the evangelical world were pretty, pretty impressed with. So I think there was a lot good there. I'd like you to comment in the, in the same regard. You, you had many years in Congress. What were you most well, proud of? Things. Let me, and let me I, and I want to also just come back. How are we going to find, yeah. how are the two of you to come, going to come together? Uh, two things. Well, one one is unconventional. Let me tell you, as a, as a Democrat who devoted myself to the defeat of Donald Trump in, uh, in uh, 2020, 
who is very close to President Biden, who was just appointed to uh, the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, let me tell you what I'm proud of, of, of the Trump administration, and that is the Abraham Accords. Yeah. If I were, you know, I'm a big believer in putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. If Hillary Clinton was elected in 2016 and implemented the Abraham Accords, I would be on every single cable network talking about how brilliant a president she was and what amazing and extraordinary leadership uh, this demonstrated. And I think we have to be fair. It was done in the Trump administration, and the Trump administration deserves credit for that. I fundamentally disagree with virtually everything else that was done, but on foreign policy, on that aspect of foreign policy, I'm proud of the Trump administration for, uh, for that. Um, and it's been a remarkable endeavor. benefit to Israel. It's been a remarkable benefit to the world. It's been a remarkable benefit to the, to the Middle East. I hope it goes further, and I hope that uh, we can now bring the Saudis in. Um, and then to answer your question more succinctly, and uh, I'm not just doing this because two of my former staffers are here, um, the, there's no bill that I can tell you was my proudest moment, no bill signing. The president, I had president Bush signed bills that I introduced, so did um, President, uh, president Bush, and so did President Obama. But the thing I was proud of was just constituent services, was getting uh, millions and millions of dollars back to veterans that I represented who were cheated out of their benefits, uh, who served in World War II or mm -hmm. Korea or Vietnam, and filed a claim, and the government ignored them for decades until my office intervened. And I would spend once a week, almost, not every week, but almost once a week, I'd be at a veteran's post rabbi handing a check to a veteran or put, pinning a medal on a veteran. That was secured by my staff and nothing made me prouder than the sense that that veteran who, who believed for a moment that the government for whom he or she fought had forsaken them, believed now that the government meant something to mm -hmm. them, that the government <clears throat> had made it right. So those are my proudest moments. I will and tell it, you the worst day in the White House if okay. you want to hear that. <laughs> sure. Um, sure. So, there was a time when I walked into the Oval Office and I was, there was this group of people in the Oval Office and I couldn't figure out who this pretty 30-something woman was standing there in the Oval Office with two little kids that were dressed up real cute, a boy and a girl, eight, nine, you know, that age, they're just perfect. And I'm looking at this gal. I was like, who is this person? I realized that, and I rewind now, about three weeks earlier, Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, came up to the White House, CIA Director, Rex Tillerson, Chief of Staff, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, and there was an ISIS cell in Yemen. And in this ISIS cell, if you can recall this, you might not unless you're a true news junkie, there was a time when there was an ISIS cell that were making laptops on bomb, uh, bombs on laptops. And they put these little bombs on laptops and they were worried that they were gonna put them next to the airline, you know, like a commercial airliner in the window at 35,000 feet and detonate a bomb on a laptop. And there was an effort at that point to say, there's a cell here in Yemen and we need to get this cell in Yemen and everyone signed off on it. And there was no argument that it was going to happen. In fact, the Obama administration wanted to do it, but they didn't have the right time. In other words, you, you want to send in the Navy SEALs when there's you know, no moonlight at all. So to get to a no moon setting at night is really what is, is necessary. So there was a time coming in the next few days where there'd be no moon in Yemen. And so we moved forward. And I realized as I walked in, and all that stuff going on, and there's chaos in every White House, certainly, but certainly where we were, I looked at this gal, and I looked at the kids, I said, wait a minute, this is the wife of the Navy SEAL that was killed in this raid in Yemen. And he was 35, his name was Ryan Owens, and what was wild about it is I looked at those kids and they were a little nervous and mom was nervous and they were waiting. And I could see that the mom was broken. But what was amazing is those kids, that I looked at them and I realized that they don't get it that dad's not coming back. Because dad's been going back and forth 
on his fifth time now. Now what really hits you yeah. is that it wasn't, it was that moment, I, I certainly don't question the decision. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not like rehashing it because it was unanimous. And that was, even if I didn't want to do it, it was going to happen, I think. But you do start to, you think about that and you see the family and you think, how easy it was for me to sit there in that room and say, yes, we need to do this. You know, I didn't, wasn't quite like that. I was like, you know, all these, this is what we're going to do. But it was the most sad moment to go out of that room and just, I went in the cabinet room and I just I sat there. I couldn't, you know. But those are the moments. In spite of all the politico and all the things you read, those are the moments that you never forget. And they're, you know, they changed two kids and a mom's life forever. Parents, everybody. That's a, pow that's a powerful memory and a powerful story. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And, but I do think we've also, we've seen glimmers of common ground. Uh, both of you have spoken about the devotion of veterans uh, and those who serve, and also the Abraham Accords. So we've at least identified <laughs> yeah, two, yeah, two sure. things already in like 20 minutes right. uh, where we found this common ground. Can, you identify, can either of you identify other areas that you think you might find a, a common commonality? I don't know. No, you guys have talked. <laughs> let's not, let's this not is our opportunity. Let's not uh, go. So um, look, I did an experiment when I was in the House. Um, with a congressman from Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's old district named Tim Johnson. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah. Republican Tim Johnson. He and I did an experiment. Uh, I won't go through the, all of the details because it's a long story. I'll summarize it in, in a minute and a half. Um, I, we created something called the House Center Isle Caucus and I chose 25 Democrats and Congressman Johnson chose 25 Republicans. And we would meet once a month at the Hunan Dynasty Chinese restaurant on 3rd and Pennsylvania. Number one, because it was very cheap. Uh, and number two, because it was three blocks to the Capitol. So if it were, there were a vote, we could, we could get to the floor and vote and come back and finish our wonton soup. Uh, <laughs> and every meeting had this format. We had a kitchen timer, literally a kitchen timer. Pick an issue, Obamacare. Five minutes, state your disagreements. Five minutes of screaming and shouting. Kyle Hill was my health LA, so he knows what those disagreements were all about. Okay, 55 minutes, what can you agree on? And this is what I learned. And this, for me, is the indispensable lesson of politics. And this is why I'm here at Lador Vador with Reince Priebus. Democrats and Republicans are going to disagree on about 75% of the issues, to answer your question. Yeah. 75% of the issues. There's a reason Reince is a Republican. There's a reason I'm a Democrat. The problem with Washington is they are so busy clobbering each other on 75% that they will never agree on that they forget that there's 25% that they can't agree on. And so the House Center Isle Caucus, we called ourselves the 25% Caucus. All we did is focus on the things that we thought we could get done. And we were able to get things done. We were able to do that. The Long Island Sound got record-breaking amounts of money. I was, a, I was a member of the Democratic minority George W. Bush signed the bill for record-breaking investments in the Long Island Sound. Why? Because I found a Republican from Connecticut that I could work with to go to the White House and say, we need this. It doesn't matter if there's a Democrat on the bill. We need this. If we can focus on the 25%, we'll be much better off as a country. Do you want part, to of, part of the problem we've got is that division is very profitable. And unity is a loser financially. I mean, when you think about news, you write a, we want to write a book. You all know I could write a book and make a million dollar advance, but... I have a good bookstore that you can sell wrote, if you want. Right. <laughs> but, but if I wrote a book about lessons learned, how does the, what's the modern political party need to do to identify voters and turn them out? And you're already bored. I mean, I haven't even finished and I'm losing you. But if I write the book about all the things I really know and how things really went down and debate prep and this, and, but you know what, that would sell because division is profitable. Hmm. If I go on TV and I want to have a unifying conversation with Steve Israel on CNN or Fox, we have no ratings. But if I want to go fight with Steve, 
Yep. And I want to have a real crossfire debate mm -hmm. about why you're screwing up our border and why we're appeasing you know, people around the world and why, are, you know, all of a sudden we're gonna have a real battle and I'm gonna lay it down and we're gonna talk about what's at stake in this country and how you're, what your party's doing. Uh, and he's gonna come back at me and he's gonna talk about division in the party. Listen, it can't be possible that in every single battleground state in America, is it possible that every race is a choice between an anti-American left-wing socialist or you know, a MAGA-hating right-wing Republican that's lost their mind? It, it, but, but, if you'd, but if you'd watch right. every right. Senate race in America, that's the choice. And 48% of the people are dead set for their person and the 48% are, and, and the 5% in the middle, they're just high, they're tired of hating each other. Yeah. And they don't believe a single thing that he's saying about me and what I'm saying about him. And that 5%, if you look at every battleground state in America, I'm telling you like a, a political fact, 20,000 votes in Wisconsin, 15,000 votes in Pennsylvania, maybe less, 11,000. Georgia was 11,000. So in other words, what I'm telling you is that we've done a good job of dividing everyone into buckets, but that 5% in the middle is deciding everything in this country. And imagine, who are the people in battleground states? It's not a battleground state. But if you're in Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, who are the 5% that have no opinion all the way up until the election day? as to what they think about all these issues, border security, climate issues, energy issues. You know, you, you're here, you're interested. I bet 90% of you have real strong opinions about all this stuff. But that 5%, they're deciding everything in this country because the rest of us are set and there's really nothing that's gonna get away. I'm sorry, I went on well too put. long. No, 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 it's okay, don't, don't you so think- So well put. Don't you think also the problem is that you know, each set of 48%, as you described it, is watching only one reality yes. and watching yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, and they can dial it in even beyond that, right? I mean, the podcast, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying because of the way the Profit Center works on division, that if, if I have, if I can divide, if I can take a subset into, you know, one million people, a subset of the entire Republican Party, the 73 million people that voted for Trump, one million like what I have to say, and I find out whatever that is, whether it be space aliens or, or something in regard to the border or certain things, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, I'm gonna make a lot of money. And as long as I keep that one million happy, I'm good to go. The business of this is enormous. It's, but it's deeply problematic because we end up not focusing on the 25% and getting, getting something well, done. Well, and it's, it's also, it's amplified by social media. And so if you were to say to me, what's the one thing that is really driving this division, accelerating it and exploding it? It's social media. Many of us got our, used to get our information about what happened during the day from Walter Cronkite. Now you are all getting it from, just about everybody here and just about every American, you're getting it from social media algorithms that are programmed to make you feel better about your opinions. It's all bias confirmation. So when we talk about being on different planets, we really are on different planets. You're spending all day long getting a democratic underground information. My mom, God bless her, lives in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. I talked to her the other day and she said, did you hear what they just said on democratic underground? I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it is a thing. And uh, if you are a you know, right-wing MAGA person and you're getting all this information from wherever it is or from um, some of the really destructive social media platforms, each of us believes that the other is the enemy. We've always had extreme partisanship in America, but now it is amplified and intensified because our brains are being played with by those conflict entrepreneurs. I, I think it's deeply, just an observation, it's deeply problematic that the, the worldview that is being portrayed is that the opposing opinion is treasonous. 
You know, that's, you know the, the person I disagree with is a danger to oh, everything I believe in and everything that this country represents. And there's, there's no, therefore, like you said, there's but, no way to find And problems. the reality is it's not the, that's not the norm in, you know, every Democrat is not treasonous and every Republican is not treasonous. And most Republicans and most Democrats don't actually believe that about right. each other. But to your point, right. that's exactly how it's portrayed it's because, nice. you know, you would think, you know, um, you would think that every school district's arguing over the same things everywhere in America and every school has the same part, b based on what you're reading. And the truth is, it's probably not the case. But because it's profitable and it gets clicks and people are, they want to hear about it, that's what's coming up in the algorithm. And what's really bad is, you know, Steve and I can take care of ourselves. Rabbi, you can take care of yourself. What's really destructive is for the kids. Yeah. Because for every message, whether you like what I stand for politically or Steve, it doesn't matter. We all have some common values, I think, what brings us here as Americans on decency and how you want your kids to grow up and how you want them to treat people, regardless of whether we agree each other. With but for every one message that you're trying to get to your kid or your grandkid, for every time you try to put, present them a message, 30 are coming into their head from TikTok or Instagram right. or you name it. And it's really hard to compete as a parent with that. And it's so dangerous, these negative things that they're watching and this, this view of what they need to look like and sound like, it's so scary. And it's, it's so destructive. And I think that's why there's, I mean, there's a tremendous rise in anxiety among, yes. among young people. And that this is, a, there's a direct correlation. I want to ask one more question before we turn to the questions, some of the questions from the floor. You've got 15 minutes just yeah, to. So we're going to get you to your plan on time. Sure. Okay. So today marks, today we, we commemorated Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Commemoration Day uh, throughout the world. Um, in our congregation, we'll be, we'll be adding prayers and songs to Friday night services. You know, and the, this, uh, I don't need to say to, to everyone here, this represents the most horrific example of what happens when anti-Semitism, you know, runs unchecked and unresponded to. Uh, so I really, I would like both of you to respond to, how do you, how do you, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. How do you respond to the, the nervousness and the anxiety in the Jewish community today because of the rise of anti-Semitism? Uh, I think the, the nervousness and the anxiety are, are well-placed. Uh, we have reached, according to the Anti-Defamation League, uh, peak levels of anti-Semitic uh, incidents by word, by deed, by physical beating, uh, and not only in the United States, but uh, around the world. Um, it is why I believe that it is a fundamental responsibility of people on both sides of the aisle to condemn it swiftly instantly and not politicize it. It does the Jewish community no service for one party to say that anti-Semitism is the purview of the other or racism is the purview of the other. We are Americans, we do not tolerate intolerance and we need to collectively uh, at every level of government condemn it swiftly and without any equivocation. That's one of the most important things that any government official can do. Yeah, I mean, I obviously agree with all of that, Steve. Without question, I think there's also opportunities to, to, to do more in schools and educating kids you, about the history. Some examples? Um, there was a bill. There was a bill recently uh, that For put Holocaust money education. in the school yep. of the Holocaust mm -hmm. education. I think that's important. I think um, obviously teaching and, and educating young people, um, condemning. I think back to social media, you know images and false stories about things that aren't true that gain a life of their own is important and our leaders need to need to identify those things and and call them out and do it immediately do you think there need to be better controls on social media i don't i mean it's an interesting topic i mean getting into whether or not social media companies should be liable for the messages that they put onto their Sites. I mean, on one hand, I believe they should be held liable uh, for the things that they do and they say. On the other hand, by taking away that shield that they now enjoy, right now, social media companies, if you don't know, they have a, they're protected from lawsuits that 
that, that they would otherwise be responsible for because of a, a law that's in place. One of the arguments against taking away that shield is that you would then encourage social media sites to edit even more, and then it would, they'd be editorializing their own political views, and then now they'd really be forced to edit people's freedom of speech. So there is a balance, but in the whole, I think, I think they should probably be held responsible. I, I want to make sure we get to a, at least, at least a 